And, and so Specker realized that this was conceivable. It's uh, analogous to what we see in quantum theory. He was thinking about quantum theory at the time. And he realized that it's possible in that scenario that when you measure these guys together, you always find that their outcomes disagree. And when you measure these guys together, their outcomes always disagree. And similarly here. Uh, because those are three different counterfactual scenarios. They can't be done at the same time. Um, let me just see if I can get this clicker working by... Maybe just plugging it back in outside of presentation mode. Oops. That's not right. Hang on just a sec. Sorry, guys. Just take a minute. Okay, how about now? There we go. Okay. Uh, so, so it's possible to imagine these uh, anti-correlated outcomes for all three. And now you say, what if there were some hidden variables, for example, uh, could, it, or could it be that there's some deterministic outcome for this measurement? You just don't know what it is. Uh, and so there's, there's some properties of the system you're feeding into the device which determine exactly what the outcome of M1 will be and what the outcome of M2 will be and what the outcome of M3 will be. And the problem is that suppose that M1 is predicted to have the green outcome, M2 is predicted to have the red outcome. Well, that satisfies this. This satisfies this guy. But then, on that very same state, I wouldn't see disagreement here. And of course, there's no assignment of uh, outcomes deterministically to these three guys that matches that pattern of anti-correlation. Yes? So, sounded like you, there are two different ideas sort of floating around that may be implementing the same other idea. When you talked about the meaning of jointly measurable, you talked about uh, is it possible to um, measure one M1 and M2 and course drain over either of them? And then you started talking about having outcomes of individual measurements agree or disagree. So those are somehow related? Well, uh, if, if I say, imagine that when I measure M1 and M2 together, their outcomes disagree, then that other measurement I was talking about, which implements M1 and M2 simultaneously. Now, note that that could be, I didn't mention this explicitly, that could be as simple as first measure M1 and then measure M2. Like in quantum mechanics, it's true that if I have two commuting observables, and I measure the first one in the right way with the right collapse <coughs> postulate, I could, you know, the way to measure them simultaneously is just to measure the first, then measure the second. So, so maybe that's the easiest way to think about measuring these two guys simultaneously. But in a general theory, that might not be true. But in any case, when you do the joint measurement of those guys, which generates two outcomes, either by doing them successively or by doing some other guy that just happens to have two outcomes, then you'll find that those two outcomes are always anti-correlated. And when you do these, the measurement that corresponds to doing these two guys simultaneously, you'll find that their outcomes, those two outcomes are always anti-correlated. Does that answer your question? I think that's a yes. Um, so you can't have this, this disagreement on uh, all three of the branches. And so what it means is that if the outcomes are indeed fixed deterministically, like we imagined, by the physical state of the system you feed into the device, and here's the critical bit. If you assume that the outcome for, for that particular ontic state, the outcome I get on M1, doesn't depend on whether I'm measuring M1 together with M2 or whether I'm measuring it together with M3, then you have this contradiction. Okay, uh, you can't have a disagreement over all three. And so if you ask 
if I chose at random one of these three pairs of measurements to implement and ask what's the probability I get the anti-correlation, then you'll know that your probability is always going to be bounded about by two-thirds, because at most two-thirds of the time, you'll be able to generate the anti-correlation. So the critical assumption here is that the outcomes that are assigned by the physical state really don't depend uh, on what other measurement is being measured together with the one you're interested in. Okay, so that's, that's the basic idea. Uh, so let, let, me, let me first of all, before moving on, ask whether um, you can see a way of doing this in quantum theory. This is a very tricky question. So let me, let me ponder that for a moment, and then I'll try to help you out. Is, can you think of a scheme in quantum theory that uh, would maybe achieve the correlations I, I described uh, back here? And if not, why not? That's do you have an idea? Yeah, I think if, if you have three measurements and they all, if A commutes with B, but if they can be jointly measured, that means they commute. Yeah. If A commutes with B and B commutes with C, then necessarily A and C should commute. Not quite. If, and, and it, sorry, yeah. A and B and B and C and A and C. Right. Then necessarily all three will commute, and then you can jointly measure them. Right. Right. So it happens in quantum theory that if you, I'll just repeat what you said, you know, three Hermitian operators, A, B, and C, if A and B commute, and B and C commute, and A and C commute, those three things have to be true if every pair of them can be measured jointly. If they all three commute, then there's some basis that jointly diagonalizes all three, and a measurement of that basis is a joint measurement of all three of them at the same time. So what it means is that in quantum theory, if we can measure three triples, then we can measure all three jointly. So what's interesting here is that Specker imagined a kind of complementarity that doesn't exist in quantum theory. So we're sort of accustomed to the notion of quantum theory that there are measurements that you can't do jointly, like position and momentum, or z-spin and x-spin. But what Specker notices is that there's a kind of complementarity that we don't see, three measurements of which every pair can be measured jointly, but the triple can't. And interestingly, so Specker died last year, but he was still thinking about this question. He still didn't, thought we didn't have a good answer to why quantum theory is the sort of theory wherein this is true, and why we aren't living in some other possible world wherein there's this kind of complementarity. But, but the upshot for us is that it means there's no, uh, the, to even get off the ground with this kind of example, you need to have a theory that has the right sort of joint, uh, right sort of complementarity structure, and quantum theory hasn't got it. Um, so you can't even ask this question in quantum theory. You know, you can't, uh, you can't say what the probability of success for this kind of task is. Okay, uh, so let me build up to, to an example that you can do in quantum theory. Yes? I still don't understand the link between being able to measure two observables jointly and agreement or disagreement between outcomes. Well, um, There are certain pairs of measurements that you can implement simultaneously, certainly in quantum mechanics. Like if I have two observables that commute, I can implement them simultaneously. So I can talk about what the correlations between the outcomes of those two observables look like. Right? So here's a really trivial example. If I measure the projector onto z-spin up, you know, think of that as a measurement. It assigns value 1 to z-spin up and 0 otherwise. And then there's the <coughs> measurement corresponding to the projector onto z-spin down. It assigns one to the value, you know, that's been down, zero otherwise. So the outcomes of those two measurements are anti-correlated, sort of trivially by, by definition. But you know, more generally, I can talk about how the outcomes of two jointly measurable, two jointly implementable measurements are related. That, that's all I'm doing here. Um, all right. Let me tell you about frustrated networks in general. So. So the idea is that uh, the nodes in a network are going to represent binary variables. The edges will imply joint measurability. And then I'm going to just denote by a straight line the, the fact that outcomes agree, and by a dashed line, the fact that outcomes disagree. But we already saw this in the context of the PR box correlation. 
And so we say the network is frustrated if there's no assignment of values to the nodes that satisfy all the correlations that they're supposed to satisfy. Um, and so these are all uh, frustrated networks on a triangle. That's the one we saw already, uh, anti-correlation between all the pairs. But here's another one. If, if these two are supposed to be the same and these two are both supposed to be the same, then these guys will also have to be the same. And so this is a frustrated network. Uh, and they're not actually, uh, you're not really positing different statistics here because you'll note that if you just label the outcomes, say, here differently, instead of labeling it by zero, you, you swapped it, labeled it by one, then it would go from uh, being uh, anti-correlated with these two guys to being correlated with them. And so I would get this frustrated network. So the only difference between these guys is the difference in the conventional choice of how to label the outcomes. Yes? When you say satisfying all the correlations. I mean, these, these are, this is like perfect correlation, this is perfect anti-correlation. So I just mean satisfying all those constraints. Do you mean that one of those diagrams depicts what you want or what you don't want? Um, the, the network specifies a set of correlations among a set of binary variables. Uh, you know, whether you are positive, you know, whether you're thinking of them as things you might want or, or not want. It's, the, the question is just, you know, when does that network, when is it frustrated? When can you not satisfy all those correlations with some deterministic assignment to all the variables? And uh, what we're going to see in the lecture is that uh, quantum theory allows you to achieve uh, correlations that uh, cannot be understood in terms of value assignments to these frustrated networks. Like the PR box was a frustrated network, for example. So if you take one of those diagrams, mm -hmm. you can see immediately which outcomes agree, which outcomes disagree, and then separately you say, these are the correlations that I want for um, measurements to share, and then you compare the two to see whether the, the diagram represents frustrated. Maybe hold off on these questions. Let me go a bit further. And if at the end of it you still kind of don't get it, ask, ask me again. But I think a lot of this just become clear as we talk more about these examples, what the role of, of these networks are. So, so this is the triangle case. The, if you go to the next simplest frustrated network, it's just a square. So you know this is obviously frustrated because these guys all have to agree, but then they would have to agree across this part as well. And all these other guys are obtained from the first one just by relabeling some of the outcomes uh, on one of the nodes. So, so if I take one of those uh, square frustrated networks, you know I, I can have this sort of scheme. Now I imagine that there are four binary outcome measurements. They have a certain pattern of joint measurability. One can be measured with two, two can be measured with three, three can be measured with four, four can be measured with one, but two and four cannot be measured together, and M and uh, sorry, one and three cannot be measured together. That's uh, what this sort of network describes. It's, we could imagine having that kind of complementarity in our theory. And, and it says that if you do uh, one of these joint measurements, you'll still see agreement here, agreement there, agreement there, but disagreement if you do these two guys. <coughs> so, uh, what does this remind you of? I know it reminds you of something. Maybe not. Bell's theorem. Yeah, it's exactly Bell's theorem. So if I just say swap the, the position on the page of these two guys, uh, it'll just look like this. I have agreement, 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 disagreement. That's exactly the popescu rurlik correlations we saw the other day. And of course, if you imagine that these, so now we don't have to, uh, we could just imagine a single system being fed into uh, these sorts of measurement devices rather than some pair of systems. Uh, the same sorts of conclusions hold. So if the outcomes are fixed deterministically by the physical state, and those outcomes are independent of the context, meaning the outcome I get here doesn't depend on whether I'm measuring it with this guy or that guy, uh, then we can only generate the kinds of correlations that this diagram specifies with probability at most three quarters, like we saw in, in the case of the, the PR box. Um, all right. So, so the, the, the connection with the PR box means that the, the assumptions that went into Bell's theorem, which were this locality assumption, um, and although we didn't uh, need it to get Bell's conclusion, we could have also imagine that the outcomes were fixed deterministically by those hidden variables. 
Um, with those two assumptions together, so Bell actually called this local determinism, they are actually an instance of context independence, just in a case where the context happens to be remote. Right? So it's saying, look, the outcome I get over here on the left wing could conceivably depend on whether this uh, measurement I'm doing here is measured together with <coughs> spin along you know, the uh, S-axis or spin along the T-axis over there. Uh, it could depend on it, but it doesn't. And in the Bell case, you say, well, it doesn't depend on it because that would be some sort of weird superluminal influence. Whereas in these more general proofs, you, you, you uh, appeal to other reasons. Uh, even if the systems are close together, you say the outcome that this measurement uh, registers shouldn't depend on what other measurements are being done simultaneously with it. That's the idea of non-contextuality. All right, so hopefully that gives you a bit of a, a flavor. We're going to go over this a couple more times, uh, so hopefully it'll get clearer as we go along. Um, let me give you an example that actually you can make work in quantum theory. So suppose I just generalize to the next more complicated, frustrated network which is a uh, pentagon that has anti-correlation <coughs> across every pair of nodes. Okay? So any, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, <laughs> not a polytope, but polygon, thank you. Okay, polygon, any polygon that has an odd number of nodes uh, will, have, will be a frustrated network if I try to put anti-correlation among all the nodes. Because as I go across, you know, alternating between outcomes, uh, the last link will give me uh, a contradiction. So the probability of generating the anti-correlations, if you choose to measure uh, each one of these pairs with equal probability, is no greater than four-fifths. So one-fifth of the time, you're always going to fail at generating the correlation in this frustrated network. So that's uh, an example of one of these inequalities uh, for <coughs> non-contextuality. If your underlying model um, is of this non-contextual sort, then you expect to do no better than that in generating these correlations. So now, unlike the triangle case, we can find a set of quantum measurements that have this pattern. So uh, <coughs> imagine five, so I'm going to do it in a three-dimensional Hilbert space. Imagine five vectors in that three-dimensional Hilbert space which have the following orthogonality properties. Every um, uh, neighboring pair is orthogonal. So L1 is orthogonal to L2, and so on. And L5 is orthogonal to L1. Uh, well, then if I imagine the, the measurement that projects onto one of them, and the other outcome just projects onto the two-dimensional subspace orthogonal to that one, then the joint measurability pattern of these five guys is exactly <coughs> this. And furthermore, so is the, the pattern of anti-correlations. Because if I get the first outcome, here, then I'm definitely going to get the second outcome on the one I'm measuring it together with, uh, because L1 lies inside this 2D subspace. So that's uh, uh, sorry, um, that, that's not quite right. What I said just there is not quite right. I, I don't, uh, I don't always get anti-correlation. I'm going to show you how much of the time we get anti-correlation. All, all I can, should have convinced you of by now is that uh, the pattern of joint measurability of this diagram is reproduced here. Um, sorry, I, I, that was just wrong what I said. Uh, okay, so so how how well can we do in terms of the probability of gen generating anti-correlation for some state if these are our measurements in quantum theory? So the first thing I'm going to do is just redraw this pentagon as a pentagram because it's going to be convenient for me. Obviously, I haven't changed anything I'm saying about joint measurability or anti-correlation by redrawing it that way. And now turn it on its side and Imagine these uh, <coughs> vectors to be the vectors in the Hilbert space. So this is a three-dimensional complex Hilbert space. But actually, it's sufficient for me to consider real amplitude vectors. Right? So, so none of these five vectors have to have complex coefficients. So I can draw the whole thing in a, a real three-dimensional vector space. And I'm just going to make each one of these vectors point to one of the vertices of that pentagram. So there's L1, L2, L3, and so on. Uh, and now I have to convince you that there's a way of doing this such that every uh, neighboring pair is really separated by 90 degrees, that they're orthogonal in this space. And uh, the way to see that quickly is that if I drop all those vectors down so that they lie in the plane of the origin, then the angle between neighboring pairs, like these guys, 
is almost 180 degrees. And if I sort of bring them up towards the North Pole, then in the limit, that angle goes to zero. So somewhere between lying down flat and being at the North Pole, they're going to hit 90 degrees. Uh, and because of the symmetry, you know, they'll all have the same angle, so they'll all be 90. Does that make sense? So I'm not going to work it out explicitly, but when you when you determine the angle that they have to uh, be at to, to enforce this orthogonality between neighboring vectors, it turns out that the angle satisfies this equation. Cos squared theta is 1 over root 5. All right. Um, now, how well can we do? How much anti-correlation can we get with this sort of uh, example? Uh, so I'm going to calculate the correlations for the case where you've prepared a system in the state psi, which is the vector that lies just along the symmetry axis of this pentagram. OK, so that's, that's our preparation procedure. And now I'm going to imagine that we do one of these uh, pairs of measurements jointly. So the one corresponding to L1 and L2. And, and of course, that's equivalent. This is a three-dimensional Hilbert space. So that's just equivalent to measuring the basis L1, L2, and the vector that's orthogonal to L1 and L2, which I've drawn in here. So if I do this measurement, and then I coarse screen these two outcomes, well, then I'm, I'm doing this first measurement here. And if I do it in coarse grain these two outcomes, then I'm doing this measurement here. So this is a joint measurement of these two guys. Good. Um, so let me just remove all the rest so we can focus in on the measurement we're actually considering. So we're preparing psi and we're measuring this uh, basis here. Now, uh, if I ask, well, what, do I get correlation or anti-correlation? Well, it all depends on which of these three outcomes you get in the measurement. So you do the measurement, right? Psi has some overlap with all of them. So you you're have some probability of getting each of these outcomes. If you get L1, then you get the first outcome of this measurement, and it corresponds to the second outcome of this measurement. So if I'm just labeling each of these as a binary outcome, then the outcomes are anti-correlated. Whereas if I get L2 as my outcome, well, then here I get the positive outcome, here I get the negative outcome. Again, anti-correlation. Whereas this is the only case where I get this outcome, that I would say that the outcomes of these two measurements are correlated. Does that make sense? Uh, and so if I then calculate the probabilities for each of those three outcomes, right, each of these guys occurring, I just have to take cos squared of the angle between them in the Hilbert space. And I already told you that cos squared theta of that angle is 1 over root 5. So this guy is probability 1 over root 5 of happening. This guy is probability 1 over root 5. And this guy just takes up the difference, 1 minus 2 over root 5. And so the overall probability of seeing anti-correlated outcomes is 2 over root 5. Of course, that's true no matter which pair I measure jointly by the symmetry of the problem. So no matter what pair I'm measuring, the probability of seeing anti-correlated outcomes is 2 over root 5. And therefore, my probability of generating the correlations that this graph frustrated network tells us is 2 over root 5, which is about 0.89. And that's greater than 4 fifths. And so it's violated that non-contextuality and equality that I told you about. So this is one of the simplest examples I know of uh, a proof of, non of contextuality, the, the impossibility of having a non-contextual value assignment in formal theory. All right, so questions about that? Yes? Would you restate the significance? Well, it's... <laughs> Let me not do it now, because what I'm building up to at the end of the lecture is, is why would anyone think that this assumption about a hidden variable model was a reasonable one? You know, why should we think that we can assign the outcomes of measurements deterministically in such a way that the outcome doesn't depend on what you're measuring it with? So I'm going to build up to why that seems natural. Um, we just showed that using quantum mechanics can violate a possible non-contextuality inequality. Yeah. Um, so I can make that statement about a non-contextuality non inequality, which is just a, a mathematical statement. But what is the significance of that? Well, the significance is that that inequality has encoded some assumptions about a possible hidden variable model underlying quantum mechanics. So uh, I, I'm going to try to argue that hidden variable models that are non-contextual are actually very natural hidden variable models. And so it's actually quite surprising that we don't satisfy those inequalities. It's like saying, well, you know, we, we can assume locality for a hidden variable model. And Bell showed that we 
we cannot have a local hidden variable model underlying quantum theory. We can't have any local model underlying quantum theory. And so if, if I can convince you that non-contextuality is a very natural assumption, like locality, then, uh, then you ought to be surprised that quantum theory violates this inequality. And remember, we said a moment ago that context independence, so when I say non-contextuality, uh, that's just a fancy way of saying it doesn't depend on context. Um, context independence in the case where the context is far away is just locality. Uh, it says that you know what, what the outcomes I get over here shouldn't depend on what's happening way over there in a space like separated region. So at least in that context, uh, you know I've, I've told you what the, the motivation for assuming context independence is. But I'm going to try to convince you that more generally, it's it's a very natural assumption. So so now I'm going to go back to uh, what you'd see in a, kind of a standard treatment of uh, of non-contextuality. And, and so here, in particular, we're going to be really focusing on non-contextuality in quantum theory. And then at the end, I'm going to get back to sort of make, coming up with a notion of non-contextuality that works for any operational theory. So here's the, the traditional approach. So first of all, what is a deterministic hidden variable model? Uh, and I'll just consider for pure states and for projective measurements. Well, we've seen something like this. It says, for every pure state, assign some distribution over some space of ontic states, which you know, you're free to posit as you like. So I'll just denoted here by one-dimensional space. Every projective measurement is associated with a set of response functions, which tell you the probability of getting an outcome of that measurement given the, the ontic state. And a deterministic hidden variable model is one wherein these response functions always take values 1 or 0. So in these sorts of models, once you specify the ontic state, there is no longer any uncertainty about which of the outcomes is going to occur. Uh, Good. And of course, if uh, this is uh, a model that reproduces the predictions of quantum theory, then it better be that the overlap squared of these guys is reproduced by the probability of lambda times the probability of k given lambda. Uh, and of course, this just picks up some region of the lambda space that we're supposed to integrate the probability over. All right. Um, so, so far I've just told you what a deterministic invariable model is. What does the assumption of non-contextuality look like in this language? Well, the, the key thing is that in quantum theory, a given vector can appear in different measurements. right? So psi 1, this vector, can appear in a basis with psi 2 and psi 3. It can also appear in a basis with a different set of vectors, psi 2 prime and psi 3 prime. And in each case, I would want to find some set of response functions representing those three basis elements. And the assumption of non-contextuality is that the response function for that vector psi 1 is the same uh, in this set and in this set. So the idea is that uh, you know, getting the outcome psi 1 teaches you something about where the ontic state is in its space. And it teaches you exactly the same thing regardless of whether you're doing this measurement or that measurement. And that's why we should assume it's, it's represented in exactly the same way. And then you might say, well, wh why should we do that? Well, here's, here's the main reason. Uh, what you notice about these two measurements is that no matter what state you've prepared, whatever preparation procedure you've done, you know, any density operator at all, if you ask, what's the probability of getting the first outcome of this measurement? You find it's exactly the same as the probability of getting the first outcome in this measurement. And, and so these measurements, uh, the first outcome of these two measurements, are extremely similar in that respect. Uh, they give the same probability no matter what the preparation is ahead of time. So that might lead you to believe that they're measuring precisely the same property of the system you're feeding into them, which would lead you to this kind of assumption. So that is going to be my first definition of the traditional notion of non-contextuality, which is that every vector uh, in, in a measurement is associated with the same response function regardless of uh, how it's measured, so regardless of the context it finds itself in, this measurement or that measurement. Yes? When you say every vector, every instance of one particular vector. That's right. So, so uh, when I think about vectors as elements of bases associated with measurements, every vector in the Hilbert space appears actually in an infinite number of measurements. Right? So you know, there's a whole continuum of bases, all of which contain side one. And so I'm saying in every one of those measurements where it appears, it should be represented by the same response function. Yes? So do we assume that um, everything 
of the context is in the set of the projective subject. Everything, say that again? Uh, every aspect, everything concerning contextuality of the measurement is also encoded in the list of projectors. I mean, ah, wouldn't it be possible that a problem is a good point. Yeah, so in, in the traditional presentation, people emphasize uh, you know, that you can vary the basis in which that vector is uh, included. But it is true that I can imagine two different measurement procedures for this one basis that differ in some respects. And the assumption of non-contextuality also says that the way I represent these basis elements should depend on the details of the measurement I've used to implement that. And that's going to, when I give you the operational definition later on, that's going to be more explicit. Yeah. Okay, so this is not the, the, the standard way of, of presenting the assumption. It, it fits better with uh, how uh, we've been talking about measurements in this course. But let me convince you that the standard way it just follows from that way. So, so first of all, note over here that if I focus on a particular value of lambda, Okay, so maybe this value here. Then uh, it assigns probabilities 0, 1, 0 to uh, you know, these three outcomes. And so if I wanted to, I could just imagine sort of assigning those values straight onto the graph. I could say, well, for any given lambda, it's going to assign a 1 to one of these three vectors and a 0 to the other two, just specifying which of those three outcomes would occur if I did a measurement on that quantic state. Um, so this sort of thing here, you know, a particular ontic state will assign values to those vectors, and it's basically saying, if you measure uh, me, this, this particular ontic state, then the, the one outcome is going to occur. And now the assumption of non contextuality is that uh, if I have this element in common in the two bases, then whatever assignment a given ontic state makes here, it's going to have to agree on this vector, uh, its assignment will be the same on, on this triple. So if, if the logic state says you're definitely going to sign out one outcome over in this basis, then it has to say that you're going to get the one outcome here. And similarly, if it says you, you're going to get the zero outcome here, then it has to say you're going to get the zero outcome here. Of course, in that case, it, doesn't, it, it may differ. The same logic state may uh, specify you, know, you get the second outcome in this basis, but you get the third outcome in this basis. All it's got to do is agree here. And so I've summarized that up. Top, you know, for every ontic state lambda, every basis of vectors receives a 0, 1 valuation. That's just what I've been talking about. Wherein exactly one element is assigned the value 1, corresponding to the outcome that would occur for that ontic state. And every vector is assigned the same value regardless of the basis uh, it's considered a part of. And that basis is, of course, the context. So again, it's just an independence of your value assignment on the choice of context. All right, now what, what Koshin, uh, you may have heard of the koshin specker theorem. Here are koshin specker uh, The koshin specker theorem, which is also sometimes known as the bell koshin specker theorem, because John Bell proved the same result, uh, is that if you're looking for a non-contextual hidden variable model of this traditional sort, um, and you ask, well, can I have one for quantum theory in hyperspace of dimension 3 or greater, you find the answer is no. Um, you can't do what I've just described. You can't underlie quantum theory with, with one of these invariable models. And the, uh, the original proof was quite difficult, uh, the one by Koshin and Specker and the one by Bell. But since then, there have been simplifications. Uh, and, and these are, unlike the proof I showed you at the beginning, these don't depend on uh, making, committing yourself to any particular kind of preparation. It's just a feature of a set of measurements. So I'm going to give you one of the, the simpler proofs. Uh, this one is due to Cabello and coworkers. It happens in a four-dimensional Hilbert space. And again, all of the bases of measurements in this proof only require real amplitudes. Um, and I've just represented for you each one of the vectors appearing in this proof as uh, an unnormalized vector in a four-dimensional space. So you know this is the vector that sort of points to the middle of the first quadrant, and so on. And uh, the, so the proof makes use of 18 rays in total, those are the 18 vectors. And you can organize these into uh, orthogonal quadruplets in nine different ways. And so uh, the authors uh, of this paper have helped us by drawing this nice diagram where a given color corresponds to a basis. So if you look at any one of uh, these colored lines, like say this one, and you verify, you'll see that 
uh, every pair of vectors that appear there are all orthogonal to one another. And you know, that's true for every one of these six outer lines, but also these squares inscribed inside the hexagon, they also correspond to a quadruple of vectors that are all orthogonal to one another. So each one of those quadruples corresponds to a measurement you could do. And uh, non-orthogonal bases can't be measured jointly, so you have to commit yourself to just one of these nine measurements in quantum theory. All right. Uh, and now I want to convince you that you cannot assign uh, non-contextual, deterministic non-contextual values to these guys. So, um, so here's how the proof's going to go. All, all I've done here is I've just written out those nine different uh, bases into nine columns. Uh, OK, and, and now that means that I've written every vector twice in this list, right? Because you, you'll notice from this diagram that every vector here appeared in exactly two bases. So for example, you know, this vector appears in the first column and the second column. And you'll find that every vector appears in two columns. OK, so now uh, what does a non-contextual hidden variable theory require? Well, it says that for each one of these uh, quadruples, one of the vectors has to be assigned a value 1, and the other three have to be assigned a value 0. And that just tells you which outcome would occur if you did that measurement for a particular optic state. So I'm asking, yeah, what, uh, what would we assign to these guys for some particular optic state? So that tells us that nine of these vectors are going to receive a value 1. This is one from each column. But I also know that each ray appears twice in this whole list. And so if I assign uh, a 1 to a vector, in every context in which it appears, then every time I assign a 1, I'm assigning two 1s overall. And so I have to be assigning an even number of 1s. Uh, and that's a contradiction, because 9 is not even. Uh, and so I can't assign 1s and zeros to this list of vectors in this context independent way. Good. Uh, so this is the next example with 117 rays in three dimensions. This is actually the original example from the Cushion Specter paper. And I'm not going to take you through it, because it's nasty. Uh, and we have much simpler proofs these days. But yeah, it's very pretty, so I thought I'd just show you what it looks like. And here's another interesting, here's another pretty picture. Uh, and, and what's great about this is it represents uh, some of what's going on in proofs of contextuality. Uh, if, if I ask you to you know, assign ones and zeros to like, any one of these bases or any pair of these, you'd have no problem satisfying all my rules. It's only globally that you struggle. Like If you sort of set things up in a certain way, then you find that you can't match it up with the rest. And so, so Escher's waterfall, you know, if you look at any region of it, everything's fine, nothing's strange is going on. It's only globally that the picture doesn't make sense. Uh, but what people noticed, actually, was that the, the rays that appear in this geometric object, so pointing to some of the vertices and the middles of the edges here, actually happen to form a cushion specter theorem in a, a three-dimensional uh, Hilbert space, uh, one due to Perez. And just last year, uh, some guys discovered another proof that has only 13 rays in it in three dimensions. And it happens to coincide with a bunch of the vectors in this shape. So just a strange, strange coincidence. Uh, or, or not. Uh, anyhow, that's, so that's, that's the traditional notion. Um, and what I want to do uh, in, in the time that remains is, first of all, tell you some problems about that traditional notion, and, and then to go beyond it. So here are some problems. First of all, we know from the first week of the lecture that projective measurements are not the most general sorts of measurements in quantum theory. And furthermore, they're an, an idealization that's never achieved experimentally. And yet, the definition I gave you of a non-contextual invariable model was geared towards projective measurements. Uh, how do we generalize that to non-projective measurements? So, so the traditional notion applies only to the projective case. Another problem was that uh, it applies only for deterministic hidden variable models. So I said that uh, these models are ones wherein the outcome is fixed when you specify the ontic state. But a more general sort of hidden variable model would allow for random outcomes, even once you fix the ontic state. And certainly, when we talked about Bell's theorem, we realized that determinism couldn't Giving up determinism couldn't salvage locality. And so you might ask a, a similar question here. Could, is it the case that giving up determinism might allow you to salvage non-contextuality? But that's you know, the, the way to achieve non-contextuality is somehow to admit randomness. So we would like a generalization that could cope with 
indeterministic convergent models as well. And then finally, maybe the most serious complaint is that uh, this notion I just defined for you really only applied to quantum theory. It talked about value assignments to projectors in Hilbert space or rays in Hilbert space. And uh, we would much prefer to have a notion that made sense for any operational theory. Because Bell's notion of locality was like that. It, it's, you can uh, write down a Bell inequality, uh, and, and that's uh, something that you can ask of any operational theory, is this inequality violated or not? And so even if quantum theory is found to be false tomorrow, because of Bell's theorem, we know that any successor theory is also going to fail to admit a local hidden variable model. So it would be nice to have a, a way of thinking about non-contextuality such that uh, you know, if, if we found some experimental evidence for the impossibility of a non-contextual model, then this would be true you know, regardless of whether quantum theory uh, was you know, succeeded by some other theory or not. Okay, so if we could come up with what I'll call an operational notion of non-contextuality, um, then first of all, that would determine, as I said, for any operational theory, whether it makes of this model. But it also means that now you can just look straight at your data and ask, can it be explained by a non-contextual model? Because you're not appealing to the formalism of quantum theory anymore. So you really don't want a definition that talks about projectors and so on. You want something that just refers directly to the data you're, you're measuring. Uh, OK, so that's, that's what we're, we're going to do for the rest of today. So let me just, uh, again, remind you what uh, uh, an ontological model is. So I, don't, I, can't remember, I think I used a realist model in, in previous lectures. Uh, I want to stay a little bit away from the term hidden variable model because, uh, as we saw sometime last week, the orthodox interpretation where there is nothing hidden, the quantum state is the ontic state, it's everything. Well, that's an example of a realist model. It just makes a particular claim about what that space of ontic states are. It's the rays and Hilbert space. So I want to include that model. So strictly speaking, these aren't necessarily hidden variable models, but most of the theories in this space do uh, postulate some extra stuff beyond the quantum state. Yes? Uh, I was just wondering whether the non-contextuality of quantum mechanics implies something about the psionic issue. Uh, they are related. It, it turns out that if you have a psionic hidden variable model, then the in, in certain respects you are trivially contextual, that you, you fail to have non-contextuality in a certain sense. Um, it, well, by, try to ask me that question again at the end of today or maybe even tomorrow, and I'll be able to do, do it justice once I've introduced some extra notions. Yes? So we discussed or realism, what quantic means, uh, how ontological? Yeah, I think, I think previously in this course I, I referred to these as just realist models of an operational theory. Um, another kind of name people often give is ontological models. So it's just a, a model that specifies what's going on in reality, whereas an operational theory just tells you, here's what you should expect the statistics of your outcomes of measurements to be. So like in the first week when we talked about uh, the operational formulation of quantum theory and how any operational theory could be represented as a convex set of operational states and a positive cone of operational effects. Those were all operational theories. And now what we're doing is uh, looking for underlying <coughs> realist models. Um, and, and so we, we talked about how you know, the idea of a realist model is to imagine that uh, out of this preparation procedure comes a system. That system has a set of possible physical states. If I know the preparation procedure P, all I know about the state is it's distributed according to some U. We also talked about how you know, a measurement should be thought of as revealing something about the properties of that system that you feed into it. And the most general uh, way of representing measurement would be with a set of uh, non-deterministic response functions. So every response function tells you the probability for getting that outcome given that the physical state you fed in was lambda. And you know, here, for example, the probabilities are non-zero for multiple outcomes. So you've seen this before. This is just uh, realist models of operational theories. That's the formula for reproducing the predictions of your operational theory. OK, nothing there uh, invoked a notion of non-contextuality. So I'm, I'm going to try to provide a generalized definition in that language that we just set up. But here's the, the kind of slogan for it, just so you, know, you, you get the idea. So an ontological model or a realist model of some operational theory is going to be said to be non-contextual if whenever you have uh, two experimental procedures that are operationally equivalent, 
meaning they're equivalent at the level of statistics of measurements, things like that, then they should be represented equivalently in the underlying realist model. That's the basic inferences being made here. When things look the same to the experimentalist who's observing the macroscopic stuff, then they should be represented in the same way. All right, so let, let me uh, be more precise about that definition. So first of all, I'm going to define an equivalence relation on experimental procedures. So imagine you have a whole bunch of different preparation procedures for some given system. So each one of these boxes just represents some list of instructions of what you might do in the lab. So if your system is a spin system, you know, these would all be different ways of preparing uh, that spin system. But again, uh, it doesn't have to be quantum mechanics. It could be any theory. So you just have a system and different ways of preparing it. And then imagine you have a whole battery of measurement procedures you can do on, on that system. And the idea is this, that if you take P1 and you do all of your measurements on P1, and for each one of them, you do the measurement many times, and you register the statistics of outcomes of that measurement. You jot that down, and you do it for every one of your measurements. You have all these statistics now. And then you do it for P4, for example, and you find actually P4 generates the same statistics for every one of these measurements. Well, then you can't tell P1 and P4 apart in the sense that if I were to put one of those two procedures in a black box, so now I haven't told you which list of instructions I've done, and asked you to figure out which was inside the black box, well, it doesn't matter how many measurements you do on the system that comes out of it, nothing about the statistics here will teach you which of these two procedures was done. Okay? So I'll call that operational equivalence of the procedures. Uh, so I can sort all the preparation procedures into operational equivalence classes. Uh, and the definition is just that you know, for all measurements and for all outcomes of each measurement, the probability distribution over the outcomes for P is the same as P prime. That's what it means for P and P prime to be equivalent. Good. Uh, whatever differences are left over between preparation procedures, I'm going to call a difference of context. So this comes back to, to Ruben's question. Um, you know, so any differences in the list of instructions I do here and here, which has no effect on the statistics of any measurement, you can just say, well, that's part of the context of the preparation. It's not critical at the operational level. So let me give you uh, some examples from quantum theory. So if I have different equivalence classes in quantum theory, they're necessarily represented by different density operators. And the reason is that if two preparations give differing statistics for some measurement, then they have to be represented by different density operators. If they were represented by the same density operator, they would give the same statistics for all measurements. So it's an if and only if. Um, the differences in statistics mean different density operators. And then a nice example of a difference of context is our old friend, the ambiguity of uh, pure state ensembles that resolve a given mixed state. So you know, these taking a coin, a fair coin, and preparing either Z spin up or Z spin down with equal probability, that's one procedure. Another procedure, take a fair coin, prepare either X spin up or X spin down. Those are clearly very different lists of instructions of what to do in the lab. Your stern garlic apparatuses will have to be oriented differently. But if I put one of those two procedures in a black box and hand it over to you, you can do any measurements you, you like. So you're blue in the face, and you will never tell the difference between which of these two procedures has been made. Um, so, so we call that difference of which ensemble you've prepared a difference of context. Uh, another difference of context was this ambiguity in the purification. So the way I could prepare a system would be prepare this entangled state of two qubits and then throw away one of the qubits. Well, that will prepare the completely mixed state. But I could prepare this other entangled state, which involves doing something different, and then throw away one qubit. That also gives the same mixed state. So it gives the same statistics. Uh, remember, you know, for this example here, uh, you know, we talked about how to describe a general operational theory. Well, it involves a convex set of operational states. The classical theory was a simplex. And in a simplex, every point has a unique decomposition to pure states. But if it's not a simplex, then there will exist some point that doesn't have a unique decomposition. So this sort of uh, non-trivial dependence on context, right? So, so cases of elements of an equivalent class differing in some kind of non-trivial way will arise for every uh, operational theory that doesn't have a simplex for the state space. OK, good. Uh, so, so now I, I'm finally in a position to tell you what non-contextuality is in this broad operational context. 
So it basically just says, so I'm going to introduce some terminology now. I'm going to say a model is preparation non-contextual. So it's non-contextual for the preparation procedures. If all the uh, preparations in a given equivalence class are represented by the same distribution over the invariables. So that would easily explain why it is that those two preparations give the same probability of outcomes for all these measurements. Because they're sampling the physical state, the elliptic state, from exactly the same distribution. So of course they're going to have to generate all the same statistics. So it's sort of an inference to the best explanation of, of why their um, measurement statistics coincide. But the alternative, which I'll call a preparation contextual model, meaning uh, the representation does depend on context, is one wherein guys who are in the same influence class can still be represented by different distributions over the ontic states. So you might say, well, how can that be? How could you possibly represent them by different distributions and still generate the same statistics for all these measurements? And the answer is, well, it could be that even though you're doing every measurement you can imagine, it's still the case that the way you model these measurements in your invariable model, uh, they all have response functions that are kind of uh, noisy and that cannot see the difference between these two distributions. So if I had a measurement that could carve up this physical state space into very narrow bins, it would certainly see this difference. But if it uh, coarse-grained over a very large scale, then this difference might be washed out. And so you could imagine uh, reproducing the fact that these two preparations have the same statistics, even though they're represented differently. But I hope you agree that there's, there's something uh, less natural about this kind of representation than the original one. This seems like a far simpler explanation of what's going on than this. And so in that sense, I think uh, preparation non-contextual models are a priori a very plausible assumption uh, of what's going on in an operational theory. OK. Um, so. So just to give you the definition now, the definition of a preparation non-contextual uh, realist model is that if two procedures, P and P prime, are operation equivalent, meaning that they give the same statistics for all measurements, then the probability they assign to a given optic state should be the same. Right? So the distribution of an optic state should be the same if the distributions over outcomes for all measurements are the same. So we've already seen examples of both kinds of model in the course. Um, so, so imagine you've just got these five operational states in quantum theory. So uh, Z spin up, Z spin down, X spin up, X spin down, and a completely mixed state. So I've just drawn them on the block through here. So one of the models you saw was this restricted statistical theory of FIPS, where the underlying ontic state space had just four elements. And these blue regions are just uniform distributions. And these were the representations of these four pure states. And now we, we know that I take an equal mixture of these two guys, I get this guy. And an equal mixture of these two guys, I get that guy. Well, in this model, the equal mixture of these and the equal mixture of those gives the same distribution, which is just the uniform distribution over all of them. And so in this model, we do have preparation on contextuality. Because no matter how I resolve this completely mixed state, it's always represented by exactly the same distribution. But you also saw, and we didn't have time to do this in lecture, but uh, you did it in <coughs> tutorial. It was this uh, quotient specter model for a single qubit. And it was basically a cosine distribution centered around the vector you were representing. So this was the z spin up, z spin down distributions. So this, sorry, this sphere now represents the ontic state space for the quotient specter model, <coughs> which is distinct from the operational state space. These were the distributions for z-spin up and z-spin down. And you know, what you showed in the tutorial was that you could reproduce the probabilities for projective measurements in quantum mechanics using this sort of model. But what you'll note is that if I take the equal mixture of these guys, I get this distribution, which is doubly lobed here and here. Equal mixture of these guys gives me this distribution. And they're different. The reason uh, you, you find that Nonetheless, these two distributions give the same probability distribution of outcomes for all measurements. Is that in this model, the only measurements, uh, all the measurements in quantum theory were modeled by just asking which half of the sphere are you in? So if I did a measurement along some n hat axis coming out here, then in this model it was just represented as asking whether you're in the northern hemisphere relative to that axis or this, the other hemisphere relative to that axis. And that's a very coarse grained sort of measurement. 
And if you work it out, you'll find that no matter how I bisect this sphere, this distribution gives exactly the same probability for uh, each hemisphere as this distribution does. Um, and so you cannot tell these two guys apart using just that set of measurements. So that's uh, what I'm calling a preparation contextual model. The way you represent uh, the procedure, which is the equal mixture of these two guys, and the procedure, which is the equal mixture of these two guys, are different in this model. Whereas in this model, they're the same. OK, and I have just a couple of minutes uh, before I have to end, so I will define for you a notion of measurement non-contextuality. Uh, but maybe I'll, I'll pause for questions about the notion of preparation non-contextuality. Clear? We're going to see explicit examples of why you can't have preparation non-contextuality in quantum theory if you go beyond subsets of the quantum states, like the one I've considered here, to all quantum states, including the mixed ones. So that's coming up next lecture. Yes? Just out of curiosity, so suppose you're working with the coffin stacker model, and you yep. only you know that your density operator is in this is density over two. <coughs> then what distribution do you assign? Well, if you believe in the Cauchy Cauchy spectrum model, the appropriate response is, if you've only told me enough about the, your preparation procedure for me to learn what the density operator was, mm -hmm. I, that's, that's not enough information for me to tell you what distribution of <coughs> the hidden variables I should write down. You need to tell me more of the details of the preparation procedure if I'm going to do that. You know, did you prepare that completely mixed state you know, as a mixture of z-spin eigenstates or x-spin eigenstates? I need to know if I want to determine how to represent it. But isn't the probability distribution epistemic to begin with? So if you just have less knowledge, you can still have epistemic probability? If you, if, you, if you wanted to, you could say, well, in, if, if I, for example, assign a uniform prior over all the ensembles of pure states that could lead to this guy. So that, or let's say somebody tells me, look, I've prepared an equal mixture of spin up and spin down along some axis. I'm not going to tell you which axis. So you assign a uniform distribution of the sphere. Well, then, you know, according to that, you, know, you would take now a uniform prior over these kinds of guys, and then your overall distribution would also be uniform over the sphere. You, you could do it that way. Um, but, yeah, if you, that kind of distribution is not um, a extremal in the space of distributions over hidden variables that this model posits. So these kinds, sorry, uh, these kinds of distributions are Extremal. These ones, you're more uncertain what's going on. The uniform distribution over the pulse sphere, you're totally uncertain about what's going on. So in a sense, you, you know that there should be some distribution you can assign for that preparation, which only has this much uncertainty, rather than full uncertainty. Uh, but without knowing the details of the preparation procedure, you can't figure out which it is. And, and that's one reason why you might prefer these kinds of models, uh, because all I need to tell you is the density operator and then you can figure out how it's represented. All right, uh, let's define measurement non-contextuality. So same thing, you can now sort the measurement procedures into equivalence classes. And here the notion of equivalence is if I put each of these guys in front of every possible preparation procedure, calculated statistics for each one of these guys, and I find that the statistics for every preparation is the same, then I say they're equivalent and any differences that remain are differences now of measurement context. Um, so we've already seen some examples. The measurement in quantum theory, it, which measures this basis here, and then coarse grains doesn't re register whether you got the two or three outcomes. It just outputs one or not one. Well, that has exactly the same statistics as the measurement that measures this basis, and then coarse grains these two guys. Uh, and if I write those as projector valued measures, they're just both, they're both just the projector into psi one and the rank two projector orthogonal to that. And the only difference is how this rank two projector gets decomposed into rank one projectors. Um, you know, this describes something about the coarse grain procedure. And the point is that it doesn't influence the statistics of this guy. Another example that you saw in, uh, in homework, uh, yeah in homework, is, is for a POVM, uh, and I've tried to use a block sphere representation for this just to kind of give you a feel for how it works. So these are two points in the block sphere 
that would correspond to, if they were states, to states that aren't pure, um, so they're mixed states. Well, there's POVM elements that are proportional to those states. And I can think of them as arising as a mixture of the measurement, the pure measurement along this axis, and the trivial measurement, identity over two, identity over two. That will give me this POVM corresponding to these two elements. But I can also choose to do this measurement with probability half, this measurement with probability half, register which one I've done. So now I sort of have four possible outcomes, you know, which measurement I did, which outcome I got. And then I coarse grain these two guys together and these two guys together, and I get exactly the same POVM. And so something like this, if, if you've uh, looked at the homework, is uh, near the end of the problem. It's another example of a difference uh, in ways of implementing a measurement, uh, which is just a difference of context. It doesn't include the statistics of those guys at all. Uh, and then you know you just basically see that because the POVM is the same. It's just how you decompose that POVM in, into a sum uh, that is is relevant. What is yes. Oh, that's a pi over. Yeah, it's pi over four. Um, and then the assumption of measurement of contextuality is that the set of response functions you use to model these two measurements should be exactly the same. So you know, here's an example of a pair of response functions to measure these two outcome measurements. And it's going to be the same for the two if they're uh, indistinguishable operationally. And a measurement contextual model would assign different pairs of response functions depending on the context. And again, uh, this isn't uh, inconsistent with what you've observed. Because you could just imagine that all of these preparation procedures kind of uh, generate too much noise over the optic state to be able to tell the difference between these two guys. Clearly, if one of these prepared you know, uh, an ontic state, like a delta distribution of the ontic states, and you, know, you prepared something over here, you could certainly tell whether it was this response function, this response function. So you would need some restriction on the distributions of the preparations to make this work. Um, and so here's the general definition. If M and M prime give you the same statistics for all preparations, then they should give you, if, if you look at the probability of outcome K, given the measurement and given the ontic state, it should be the same whether the measurement's M or M prime. All right, uh, so the final thing is just that if you think about the reasons for assuming preparation ontic and measurement ontic they're exactly the same. It's sort of this idea that when things cannot be distinguished at the operational level, we should not assume that they're distinguished at the realist level. So uh, I would say that preparation architecturality is as natural as measurement architecturality or as unnatural if you don't think either of them are natural. But you should really assume them together or not at all, I would argue. And so the, from this perspective, the, you know, the best notion would just be assume uh, both, see if you can have that. Uh, measurement non-contextuality is closer to the traditional notion we, we talked about. I'm going to say a bit more about that next time. And here I'm just trying to argue that preparation non-contextuality should be seen as uh, just as intuitive. And then finally, this question we asked, you know, why is non-contextuality plausible at all? Well, this gets back to the kind of things we're talking about with Plato's cave. So there's a kind of a methodological equivalence principle, you might say, uh, which is that if a difference in uh, your setup is not distinguished in the observable phenomena, then it should not be distinguished in the ontological picture either. So the guy who postulated colors for the objects that were casting the shadows was postulating a difference in the ontological picture that did not register in the observable phenomena. And you'd say, well, that's uh, not good science. And so it's a similar idea here. You would like to have it that your ontological picture only invokes differences when those differences have some effect in what you observe. And uh, let me end there.